Welcome to the Watch Pitch 50th podcast and videocast. I am thrilled that you're here and I'm looking forward to sharing with you some amazing insights with regards to what's happening now in the new normal. My name is Trey Scott. I'm the founder of Watch Pitch and we are going to join over 40 guests who have been on the Watch Pitch podcast before and who are going to share their insights with regards to what's next for startups, entrepreneurs, and investors. What we're gonna do is essentially sit down with all of these prior guests from the Middle East, from overseas in Berlin, in Europe, in addition to the New York coastline and the California coastline, to discover how this new normal is affecting everyone, most especially startups, entrepreneurs, and investors. So let's get started. I'm thrilled you're here. You won't want to miss this. Let's go. Right, gosh, so great to be here and thank you everyone for being on this call. Uh, we are here in the middle of May of 2020 and this is the 50th episode of Watch Pitch. Watch Pitch was launched as a vehicle to connect startups and investors to create more efficiency in their conversation to create deal flow uh, a lot more effectively and certainly more efficiently for both parties. And all of you on this call have uh, shared with me some amazingly powerful insights with regards to how best to navigate this territory, either as a startup, as somebody who has actually had an exit, uh, and many of you who are advising other startups and investors in selecting the right type of marriage and partnership. And so I just want to acknowledge that I think this climate because of COVID and the global pandemic has changed some of the rules. And part of my invitation is to talk with you to learn a little bit more about what you're discovering in this ecosystem uh, with regards to changes that are needed. I want to acknowledge that this virus does not pay attention to borders. More than 72 countries have confirmed cases of this pandemic COVID-19 virus, um, more than 2.2 million cases on the globe and well over 150,000 people have died from this virus. It's impacting exports, it's impacting imports, restrictions have basically broken a lot of economies and very specific industry sectors. And governments are not coordinating all of this very well. Here in the US, we have more than 22 million people who are unemployed. And you know, the black swan for this pandemic may not be necessarily the pandemic itself, but the disruption it's creating with regards to resource allocation. And some of the structures that we have currently in place may have something to learn from the startup culture because I believe this health crisis is becoming an economic crisis. And because we are in the space of startups and investors, that's a big part of the economic engine in all of our countries. And I'm wondering who might like to get us started with what and how this pandemic is impacting your specific ecosystem. Yeah, go ahead, please. And I'm not hearing any audio, just a Let me get unmuted. Oh, here we go. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, my name is Aaron Welch. I'm actually a multi-time founder, and I'm currently working as the games are at a company called Freight Waves here in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, our company, both the company that I work for during the day and the startup that I'm continuing to do at night, has shifted pretty dramatically. Um, our main line business here at Freight Waves is we're essentially Bloomberg for the freight industry. And we have gotten to see not only what you guys see from the news perspective, but also the inner workings of how things move, how freight goes from one place to another, how the supply chain is breaking down in some places and then picking up in others. And so for us as a company, it's been very interesting to be this source of inside information as well as to be on the receiving end of how COVID can force a business to really evaluate how its day-to-day -day operations 
can change for the better for the employees even during this downturn. So our CEO had the insight to actually go, you know, a lot of you guys uh, work at your desks, don't really doing anything. And he's like, you could just as easily do that from home. So even before there was any mandatory stay at home uh, rules, he sent us all home. And so the company has made the decision that we won't have anybody here in the office other than the critical television team until next year. And so from that perspective, for the day job, it's been pretty interesting to see them quickly adapt to these new things and then oddly enough, start to thrive based on kind of the market changes that have happened. And then the startup that I was working on the in the evenings has kind of shifted from our recommendations engine to how do we help people find things that they need when they, there's no idea who has them. And so what we're doing, excuse me, is kind of matching between people who are in need of something and people who may have it and then not know what it's worth or that there's even someone looking for it. So it's been very interesting to, to be on both sides of the coin and kind of see all these things and adapt to it as quickly as we possibly can. Yeah, and Aaron, I mean, just to create context for some of the other guests, uh, you had this startup, Worley, which is maybe now your night job, which was so focused on restaurants and businesses and giving people you know, uh, tips with regards to when you land in a town you've never been before to be able to get some really hot ticket recommendations for people to go visit. Um, what a what a heart crusher this has been for you. I can imagine. Yeah, I mean, it, it was uh, it was very funny. Uh, <laughs> we had focused the product to be how do you get recommendations from an Uber or Lyft driver or an Airbnb host? Because right. all these people are traveling, doing things, right. and then all of a sudden we're having to stay at home. <laughs> so it's yeah. like, what do you do? Okay. So uh, what we what we had is is some insights on how we connect people who have a demand an inherent demand mm -hmm. versus people who have a supply. And so what we've done is just kind of focus more on the demand side than the supply side. So eBay, Facebook marketplace, Craigslist, all that's about the supply side, who's got it, mm -hmm. but none of those ever take into account who's looking. And so there are certain things that in different areas are more valuable here <laughs> for the longest time. It was ground beef, uh, chicken and eggs. That was like what people were looking for. And it's now started to evolve into people are looking for things like breast milk and baby mm -hmm. formula or anything mm -hmm. to kind of sustain. And whereas the supply chain for those previous things, the eggs, the, the ground beef has replenished, we've still got people who have hoarded those things that are critical to life for, mm -hmm. you know, new mothers. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, I'm curious, Brett, this might be a good opportunity to bring you on uh, because you also had a business that was very sort of high touch and interactive where people were um, dropping into a virtual reality experience. You were doing a lot of team building with groups in that environment, both on site and off. You really thought this through and I think you're on a cutting edge and I think that some of the others that are on this call have also been in very leading edge technologies and um, trying to connect people in very dynamic ways. And that, that, that verb of connection is now needed to pivot. What, what, what kinds of things have you discovered? Yeah, um, your mic is cutting out a little bit, so I'm, I'm not sure I'm tracking the question correctly, but what I'm hearing is the question around connection and how technology now, given COVID scenario, is impacting uh, my business and maybe the ecosystem that I'm seeing. Is that exactly. correct? Exactly. Yep. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> let's see. Yeah, it's been uh, really interesting. Again, to give some context, my my world is virtual reality. So um, the the wearing of headsets is a pretty serious focus of my business, and I was doing that with uh, Fortune 500 companies, bringing them into my studio or going to their headquarters. Um, putting headsets on them, uh, walking them through various kind of mind-blowing experiences and challenging experiences instead of, you know, going on a ropes course or on a long hike, uh, you could you could do something right there in your office. So very hands-on, very um, directly connected to each other as a business model. And, uh, and we were just ramping up so that we were going to start going on the road and start to go to offices a lot more aggressively 
so it was a pretty big stop. And um, immediately when we all went into quarantine, um, my advisors were all like, oh, this is the perfect opportunity. VR is in the right place. Everybody can be at home and just do their own virtual mm -hmm. reality experience. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know, if I could have timed this, uh, I, this would be really convenient for us in about a year. Uh, virtual reality mm -hmm. just isn't there yet. In fact, I bet if I asked uh, the, the panelists here to raise their hand, and if you own a VR headset, would you do that for me? How many own a headset? Yeah, so two of us own their own headset. Therein lies the exact problem. Mm -hmm. So um, on top of that, everyone uh, kind of went into total shock, right? So to uh, what, what we all needed um, eight weeks ago, and really I, I think still is needed, is safety, um, familiarity, comfort. Uh, and, and at this point, less technology and more connection. And so to, so to introduce virtual reality as a, a new thing that's heavy tech, that's going to require a lot of, you know, learning and yeah, gosh. it just was uh, not, it's not the right model. Right. So right. I focused very heavily on um, culture and where my uh, consulting could focus on helping people communicate better. Uh, and I, we have a partnership, uh, Better Than Unicorns has a partnership with a company called Delivering Happiness, mm -hmm. which is a culture consultancy, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I know it. not Fantastic. so much focused on tech. Mm -hmm. uh, and so mm -hmm. I became very aligned with them and ran some uh, workshops through them and have been working to help their book of business um, stay connected and, and be as uh, sensitive as a leadership and management teams as possible to the 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 situation that individuals may be under and how can they demonstrate compassion uh, at a distance. So, um, Brett, I'm wondering uh, in the context of uh, needing to make these pivots with new businesses, I know, Cecily, one of the pieces that you are doing there in the Bay Area is advising lots of startups. This is a key role for you and you've been doing that fabulously for Watch Pitch as well. Um, Cecily, I'm, I'm sort of curious uh, what you're advising with regards to maybe turning up the volume on this verb of connection for both startups within their own organizations in addition to maybe their relationships with their investors and maybe even rethinking some of their tech. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a super interesting time. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing I've done over the last couple months, which has been a fun exercise, is actually turn it around a little bit and be as much of a student to the founders and entrepreneurs with whom I work as I am an advisor. So mm -hmm. I spend a lot of time just kind of listening to what they're going through and supporting them step by step because things are changing week over week from a capital availability to a team stability to a product direction, you name it. Um, so much has been in flux. and. One thing I noticed about four weeks into this was that some of the companies that I advised were really thriving through this period mm. and some are really struggling. And so I started to pay close attention to what it was that made those ones that were doing really well stand out. And it actually applies to a, a methodology that I've been using for a while, which is something called ACE Ops. And ACE is a great acronym for adapt, communicate and embody. And founders that are kind of really honestly and immediately looking at a situation and being willing to quickly change, which in the first couple weeks meant uh, burn adjustments most prevalently. Mm -hmm. um, and then it evolved into more product tweaks and some other changes with regard to how they're communicating with investors and the like. Um, that, that willingness and ability to adapt quickly has been key. And then communicating with the team so that everybody's on board right. very quickly. And that means the internal core team as well as any external partners or support. Mm -hmm. And then critically embodying that change. So if they're saying that we are, you know, leaving this direction and heading in this one as a leader and a founder, I've really seen those that have picked up that opportunity to demonstrate their commitment to that shift have been the most successful. Mm -hmm. um, I work with the Search Inside Yourself Leadership Institute, and we've actually added a P to this. We're calling it PACE now. And there's this really critical ingredient to success in this time, which is a pause. Um, and it's something I think people don't do enough, and this is a good opportunity to do that, is to mm -hmm. 
kind of take take a moment and actually just pause and reflect and get a sense of what is working and what isn't and make very thoughtful decisions, which are inevitably going to have impacts for many months, possibly years to come. Um, so it's been a, an interesting time. I've, I've enjoyed witnessing some really transformational work on the part of some startups. It is a very difficult time, but it's uh, it's an important um, opportunity as well. And thanks for including me, Trey. I am going to jump in a few minutes, okay. um, but I, I love being part of this. Uh, yeah, well, I'm just so grateful for you being in our mix. And I think that's a really super powerful with regards to this pace idea and the importance of pausing. And, you know, this is a great segue into Bill Treasure, who I also know needs to leave fairly soon, but Bill is in the business of, well, Giant Leap Consulting, and Bill is basically a courage maven. I mean, he has for decades um, empowered people um, to, and empowered organizations to step into their courage, and this is something you, you, you support with people um, in all kinds of very innovative ways. And um, I'm wondering, how courage is playing a role in these very sort of unstable times at the moment. And they're only unstable because we've never been here before, but everybody's here. Um, so I'm right. wondering if you might jump in a little bit and, and touch on this. Sure. And uh, congratulations, Trey, 50 uh, episodes. I know. Uh, Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, it's, awesome. it's been good, great good to have you, man. On. I know I was one of the early people. Yes, you were. Yeah, um, yeah this is this right now we're in the midst of a, a universal uh, experience of vulnerability. And, you know, courage is never comfortable, right? Mm -hmm. Courage and fear have a tight relationship. And when you're in a courageous moment, typically you're fearful, not fearless. Like when we see those bumper stickers, like, no fear. That's not courage. Yeah. Courage is vulnerable and uncomfortable. And we all got shoved off the high dive ladder with, you know, with no control of this. And we had to sort of figure our way out as we're flailing in mid-fall. Yeah, right. And, you know, and pivoting is the word, right? It's like the, the word of the moment. And I think initially, 10 weeks ago, there was a lot of fear and anxiety. And I think now we're sort of figuring it out. I think of Richard Rohr, or, uh, Father Richard Rohr, who talks about, you know, we start from order. Everything makes sense and our world is confident and it's predictable. And then boom, the apple cart goes up in the air, pan, uh, the pandemic hits, and now we're in disorder and nothing makes sense. And I don't know what's coming next. I don't know when it's gonna end. And I've got a high anxiety moment. And, and eventually we get to reorder. And, I, and that's sort of where we are now, is trying to figure this out and trying to get some semblance of control uh, back to us. But what I'm finding is that, that the leaders that I'm working with smartly, are recognizing that right now is not about skill building. Like mm -hmm. I do a lot of training and development, right? Mm -hmm. People don't want, it's not skill building right now, it's more about coping. So very quickly mm -hmm. we have to pivot and do real time stuff like positive perseverance. We did a whole work workshop on that. Mm -hmm. Mental well being and physical well being. The mm -hmm. big three, uh, diet, exercise, and sleep, self care. Uh, and then this idea of experiencing our courage and allowing ourselves to be vulnerable. It's okay to visit pity city. You just can't live there. You got to right. let it out, right. get, feel the feeling and then right. start moving on. The good news is we are carrying on and we're figuring our way through this and we will get to the other side mm -hmm. and we'll be stronger because of it. Mm -hmm. uh, we're certainly tapping into our entrepreneurial zeal in ways that we haven't in a long time. Desperation can sometimes be a good thing for a business. But we are experiencing our courage right now just by carrying on. Yeah, so true. And, you know, this reminds me, uh, Angie Flynn MacGyver, I, I, I'm so thrilled you're here. And I know you've got this big event tomorrow to actually help people with the conversation that they need to have in order to connect and to pitch, if you will. Um, you have an event tomorrow, uh, Ignite CSP. And that event is... Uh, basically a, an opportunity to, to learn with you some skills to help support people in this conversation and in this presentation to people during a time that we know that stress levels are a little higher than we're all used to. I'm curious if you might speak a little bit to just how to have these conversations um, when you want to engage a you know, pretty significant relationship like a pitch with a potential investor. Right. The 
the workshop that you're talking about is the virtual pitch workshop. We're doing that tomorrow with JB Media. In fact, Josh Dorfman, who's on this call, is uh, oh, going to be joining us oh, great. Uh, as well. So uh -huh. we're Fantastic. Uh, excited about that. And and the idea here is, and I really want to echo what Bill and, and Brett already said about really this idea, what I've been experiencing. Uh, my company specializes in communication skills coaching. So we're very much in the leadership development space, um, delivering trainings, delivering workshops. And so not only did my business uh, feel immediate impacts because we travel all the time. Mm. Uh, we used to travel all the time. Now we travel, not at all. Right. Um, and so we've moved completely to coaching via Zoom, which we were mm. doing before, mm. but now of course that's that's 100% of our work. But mm. my experience was exactly what they've uh, already articulated, which is that it, it's not about skill building right now. It's about how do I take uh, what already feels comfortable and, and doable to me and how do I move it into this new space? So that's really what this workshop is going to be looking at. How do we how do we make these high stakes asks, whether for uh, entrepreneurs and startups uh, and, and B2B sales or in nonprofit fundraising, how do we do that in this two dimensional space when so much of what we rely on in communication is now uh, not available to us. Uh, so part of what we're talking about in this workshop is humans have really evolved to understand each other best when we're in the same place. And there are a number of deficits that we incur every time we take a step away from being uh, occupying the same three dimensional space. And so that's what we're gonna be talking about tomorrow in this workshop and, and some, some tangible tools and techniques to use when those, uh, when those conversations are happening. Well, what a, what a powerful partner you got there in Justin Bellamy and JB Institute. It's really, um, they've, they've got some great yep. uh, skill sets in-house and to be able to share those at this time is super important, I think, for everybody. You know, uh, I've also got Juan Garzon on the call and uh, Juan, I, you know, you started this event and this culture of doing pitch breakfasts in the, in the Charlotte area in addition to uh, a lot of uh, North Carolina, including here in Asheville. Um, what are you seeing in the pitch space? Because I know you've actually had some virtual events and what are you seeing in the pitch space that's needed to acknowledge these times? I'm wondering if there's, you know, some startup businesses that might be taking advantage of this time uh, because of the challenges uh, that maybe are um, you're seeing more of, or, or maybe, um, and again, I'm very curious about just the approach that people are taking that might be more sensitive to this current time that would help our ecosystem here at Watch Pitch. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's great that um, uh, Brent uh, or Trent earlier mentioned the idea of uh, connection being so important. We just had our second virtual pitch breakfast event. And one of the big pieces of feedback that we got from the first virtual pitch breakfast event was that people came to our events, uh, you know, people came to, to see the pitches, to learn from the panelists and from investors, but they also really get a lot from the personal connections that happen mm -hmm. after the event, the networking. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, some of that was missing in the first event. So we actually mm -hmm. ended up redoing the event or, or, or doing a second version of the event where we broke attendees up into breakout rooms and they got to connect, you know, in person in small groups and get to know each other. And uh, one of the things that, you know, I'm sure anybody who works with entrepreneurs knows is uh, founding a company can be a very lonely road. Entrepreneurship can be very lonely. And um, they need the support of the ecosystem of, of support groups and uh, investor groups and accelerators and mentors. And right now they're not getting that. And so it's very important to try to make as much, give as much opportunity to founders to have those personal connections uh, and to network as possible. Juan, uh, this, this reminds me uh, too of some of the other gentlemen that are on this call, both Jeff and Brian, um, who are in the merger and acquisition business on a global level. Um, and I think this high touch, high connection that's required to better understand one another is something that um, makes so much sense in this day and age and the need to do that more. Um, I'm wondering if your teams at Viking and CDI Global are um, 
figuring out a way to do those breakout sessions with companies, one another, potential buyers, um, and, and how much of your business has actually changed. Brian, I see you're up first, so. Yeah, sure, thanks, Trey. Yeah. Um, th things have changed um, significantly. Um, we've seen across the board, around the world, we have offices globally, but we, we've seen a lot of smaller companies uh, are starting to get nervous. Um, obviously from from a capital perspective as well as what's going to happen in the next you know six to 12 months and i think there's going to be a huge opportunity for some of the larger companies to come in and, and acquire a lot of small businesses huh. um, interesting I, I i also have have talked to several local companies here in the southeast that are you know mid-sized and small and they're even contemplating, is this the right time to get out? And they're kind of kicking the tires on their own company in terms of what's the value and what's, is it worth staying in for another, you know, two or three years, even though they may be growing hmm. at, a, at, a, at a particular uh, time at the moment. But and is that, overall, because of the, is that because of their products or their service or? It, it, both. 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 Uh -huh. I mean, they, they're, they're in an industry that, that seems to be growing. It's an outdoor living space. And obviously in the Southeast United States, we, we have a lot of that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And with everybody staying home, everybody's kind of learning how to cook for themselves for the first time in, in right. South Florida. Um, <laughs> but uh, what, what we're seeing also is that um, a lot of the deals are starting to uh, – falter and and kind of no longer go through because what was valued six months ago uh, acquirers aren't willing to pay uh currently and, and you know there's going to be a large discrepancy in, in valuations uh moving forward because you you still have a lot of private equity firms who have a lot of money who believe that they're going to be able to get a good deal on a lot of companies um and and People who are tied to their company probably still want some semblance of a, a fair valuation. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out in the next six to twelve months. Right, Jeff. Jeff, what are you seeing um, in terms of sort of variances during these times for Viking mergers? Well, as, yeah, as as Brian pointed out, we are seeing uh, quite a few changes. Um, one of the most significant changes I'm seeing right now is the number of inquiries that I'm getting from investors. Um, I'm, I'm fielding more inquiries now uh, than before all of this began. Mm. And sort of categorized um, investors right now into three categories. There's the ultra conservatives. Uh, they're sitting on cash. Uh, they're holding it very close and uh, they're, right now not sure how they want to proceed. Um, mm. Then there's the nominal investor. Uh, they're sort of taking it step by step and business as usual, mm. looking at the financials more closely. Mm. Uh, everyone wants immediate financials. Uh, last year is ancient history. Everyone's wanting current financials uh. last, these last 60 days. Mm -hmm. So we're working with our clients to ensure that they're able to turn around uh, financials immediately at the close of a month. And also we're wanting to get more up-to-date information on a daily basis, even with some of our clients as to how their bookings and billings and everything are running. And then the third is what I call the ambulance chasers. Um, I'm getting a lot of people calling, uh, looking for the disaster, uh, looking for, for the company that's on fire and that they can come in and scoop up. And um, in fact, I had a call right before we got on this call from one of those type of investors. And I let them know that my clients right now are not in that situation. Um, so it's not a fire sale, have, mm -hmm. not a fire sale. And mm -hmm. we're not even to entertain that at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, everyone's got their own per perception perspective. Um, Brian and I are collaborating a lot, sharing a lot of ideas and, um, you know, one of the things that I look at personally, um, I don't know what the new normal is. Uh, I don't know what it means. I don't know that we have enough data yet to determine what the new normal it will be. Hmm. Um, I think over time we'll see a regression to the mean. Uh, I think um, we'll just have to take some time and work through this. So one of the advices that I would give uh, business owners and founders and startups and those type people is, you know, if, if you are considering the sale of your business during this time period, you really need to do a self-check on what is your motivation. 
Are you responding to just the crisis moment? Um, and is that the best decision? Uh, what we're doing is we're coaching business owners that unless they have some other motivating need to divest, um, it may be something that has nothing to do with the COVID situation, mm -hmm. uh, then it may possibly be best just to defer at this moment. Just to hold. Yeah. Yeah. Let's take sense. a little bit. Let's get a better understanding of what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So, Gabby, I see you uh, just joined the call from Tel Aviv. Uh, you work with some pretty big global companies, and you also work with startups in the Tel Aviv startup nation. And I'm sort of curious what you're experiencing there in Tel Aviv in particular with the, your startup culture. I mean, you've, you know, you, you know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of startup country, uh, companies. Uh, and yet you're also very, very specifically working with some global brands. And I'm wondering what you're seeing in those relationships at the moment. Um, are, they, are they needing more communication? Are they just saying, hey, pause, everything's just too crazy to make big decisions? I, I'm curious from your perspective. And thank you for joining the call from Tel Aviv. I know it's late there. So hi, everyone, and sorry, sorry for joining a little bit late. Uh, no worries. Uh, it's uh, 7 p.m. I'm here in Tel Aviv, and uh, I think it's it's uh, what we, so we work. I'm the general manager of the builders, and we work with uh, companies like Warner Media, Coca Cola, Walmart, uh, Mercedes, and other companies. And and I think it's for me one of the personal kind of uh, lessons learned from this uh, the COVID COVID uh, pandemic is is how everything's very uh, a personal and b local. Uh, so someone who's in Germany now in Stuttgart, uh, who's dealing with uh, no more toilet paper and they run out of toilet paper, uh, has a very different experience of the pandemic, is dealing with uh, the personal pandemic. Someone in New York who's seeing really terrible things are happening there and very, very serious thing. A lot of those things are going to necessarily in impact your business uh, decisions, impact your business, uh, the way you approach things. And uh, in, in Tel Aviv, when we were locked down, uh, we had the feeling the world's going to end. It's terrible. It's going to be gone. And and uh, this week they opened up and things open up pretty pretty seriously. People are in the streets and you walk outside in the streets. It's it's hard to think the world's going to end when you see everyone driving in scooters to the beach. So it's there's a lot of uh, kind of very local effect on on where things are happening. So our friends in Atlanta will see see things in one way. Uh, friends in Germany will see things in, in a different way. And uh, I think we moved from uh, one one of our partners had the term. Uh, both feet on the brake pedal uh so that was how they started and uh and moving from st step one every stopping everything and and i think now slowly slowly we're seeing in different places in the world kind of a little bit opening up uh there, there are exceptions and so some people who I, I think also generally uh the people who look at things in generally positive more positively we're more open to explore and to keep on working and okay things change but what can we do what can we continue doing even uh, things changed um uh, for, for the entire world versus let's stop everything and, and revise what we're doing. Uh, I think startups are more and more um, uh, looking at, at what can we... So first of all, we went through a phase where let's look at our PL, let's look at all our expenses. What can we cut to survive longer, to extend our uh, burn rate and to be able to go for longer longer time without investments? Uh, so that was the first reaction. I think now um, there's a very interesting investor uh, investor group called NFX, and one of the things they said, uh, they had a very interesting insight. They said is startups are going to survive are not the ones that are cautious, are the ones that are the ones that are going to go for the go for the kill, try to find what what are opportunities, and move from defense to offense and back and forth. So it's, it won't be only defense, it won't be only offense, but being able to know going back and forth on, on those and being able to be not in a wartime mentality, wartime CEO mentality, but also being able to flip back and forth. Um, so that that's on the startup side. And I think eventually what, what for me was, uh, it's, it's almost trivial, but everyone are human beings and whatever whatever we, we can do and understanding what what are people going through when when they're going through this it kind of trumps business and and makes you makes you think about um, what's what's the priority now and startups are saying are asking us should we sell more should we pitch more should we send them more emails and uh, the short answer is no uh, so so it's uh, it's kind of a more understand and um, Pete did a session for our startups a few weeks ago and it was is very, very, I think one of the insights for the Hamas were 
kind of ask and listen and learn and really try to figure out what the person on the other side is looking for instead of just sending another email or sending another kind of approach, uh, trying to approach from another direction or here's co I know COVID's happening. Here's what my solution does. Mm -hmm. uh, so kind of opening up more to conversation. Yeah. And, and Gabby, I'm sorry, we missed a little bit of what you said, but it's so spot on in terms of how you landed on this. And I've actually got Pete Scott from Warner Media on the call as well. I'm glad you guys could join me both at the same time. Um, Pete, you know, you, you are there operating a pretty big brand and, you know, your job is really focusing on innovation. Um, I love hearing from Gabby how you're actually advising um, these startups who you know want to do business with Warner Media, the other brands that the Builders is working with. Um, and, and I'm hearing that this need for connection is something that just has to be reinforced and it may not be necessarily something that's hinging on a sale or some new feature in a piece of technology with the, the company that they're in relationship with. What are you learning from this particular time for both Warner Media and then also in the relationship that you have with the builders? Thanks, Trey. Uh, listen, I think for uh, a large company like AT&T and Warner Media, um, you know, we've had to deal with some sort of amazing changes. We couldn't do we couldn't do our NBA playoffs. We couldn't do March Madness. Couldn't generate any revenue for that. Um, and I, I think for us, that's a big component of how we survive. I think the other mm -hmm. side of the coin is is everybody needs to be on their phone. Everybody needs to use broadband. So and everybody's watching cable or or leveraging the broadband for Netflix or all these SBA platforms. Um, I think whether it's in that view or even with startups, it's all about connecting and having an authentic relationship with people. Um, one of the things that I've done personally is in at Georgia, as you know, you can go bowling and get a tattoo if you need that here in the great state of Georgia. Um, I've been going on long walks. I've been going on long walks with my employee, uh, some of my employees um, mm -hmm. and you know, distancing through long, you know, walks through parks or um, those types of things. And I think what you first do in the first 15 minutes is you're just human mm. and you're just checking in mm. um, and how things are going. And I think that's so wonderfully authentic. And what I sort of stress that with Gabby and a lot of the freelancers and even just some of my coworkers, it's just really caring and understanding, you know, who you are, how it's going or advertising sales teams or reaching out with a newsletter every week to let them know to all their different clients, hey, this is what we're doing, this is what we're thinking about. What is your, uh, we have sort of this whole new thing we're kicking around a post COVID strategy. Mm -hmm. So how are we gonna go back to our brands? How are we gonna go back to our league partners, even our customers and sort of say to them, okay, these are the four bullet points, three bullet points that we're gonna focus on uh, during post COVID and make sure that we're focusing on those things. So mm -hmm. I think ultimately Trey, it's just being authentic what I, love as an entrepreneur and maybe even some of um, your friends or VCs, listen, COVID created more dis uh, digital disruption than any CTO or CEO could possibly have forced to do themselves. This, this now ability for people um, to know what Zoom was a month ago, they had no idea, mm. to be able to stream and to basically engage with digital in ways that people never thought of and how it's going to beget so many other new digital things. Mm is inspiring. It's, it's, it's so interesting now that, you know, now people, you don't have to wait as long to sort of describe what digital transition is, what, where digital is going, how people are engaging online or through their phones. And that part's inspirational for me because, you know, myself and VCs, this is what we need to do. We need to sort of push people to places they've never been, been before. So again, I would say being authentic, you know, from day one with your customers, your startups, and then taking advantage of this opportunity where digital disruption has been just flipped on its head. I think we lost Trey. Um, you know, on the, on the, uh, by the way, you, uh, Gabby's not in prison. Um, <laughs> that's just his, that's just his cool house in uh, his apartment in Jerusalem. Yeah. It's an amazing place. <laughs> uh, we lost you. We, we were on. We lost you, Trey. We you, lost okay. you. Sorry. Go ahead. 
No, I think Jeff, you, you hit it on the head. You know, there's uh, all kinds of people out there that have put their money underneath their mattress and they're being conservative. And then there's others that are sort of looking, this is an amazing opportunity. You know, we're in the sports betting business now. And so I don't know if you saw uh, DraftKings went public two weeks ago and the amount of money, you know, you, if you, they opened up at 14, $15 a share and they're, oh, they're at 25, almost $27. So you know, institutional money is thirsty right now, right? To basically put mm -hmm. their bets in places where, um, you know, things are different or things can be, you know, figured out in this world. So I think it's our responsibility as innovators and VCs is just, you know, keep sort of seeing where the trends are going and how do we sort of help, you know, a lot of these different smaller companies sort of maybe, you know, make a small pivot. It's a, it's a used word a lot, but I think there's a lot of potential opportunity um, for sure. Yeah, that's so true. Um, so I'm, I'm very curious, uh, actually, um, Josh, you know, you have been in this space of startups and entrepreneurs, and we're really there at the very beginning with watch pitch. And I know you've made some pivots, but what are, what are you recognizing as now a founder, uh, of a startup? In, in terms of the kinds of conversations you have to have, not only with your team, but also, of course, with all the stakeholders that you have many relationships with. Well, um, first of all, Trey, again, congrats. Hey, 15th thanks. episode. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah, thanks. As a fellow podcaster, I know what goes into making that happen for right? so long. I know, exactly. Uh, yeah, you know, I would say... I'm not sure that I have anything particularly profound to add. I would say that certainly we go back to our stakeholders. I, I run a modern sustainable furniture company with a factory here in Western North Carolina. We go back to our, our factory. We check in. What's their capability? What's their capacity? What I want to do in this time where we're seeing, you know, in, this, in some respects, um, our sales have, I mean, our sales have certainly dipped. We're also, we sell through West Elm. So we have a channel that's relatively stable there. Mm -hmm. But what I've, so when I've looked at where we are, I've thought, you know, we are playing a little bit of defense. And so by playing defense, what we're doing is we are actively prototyping a lot of new products. Um, we're talking with our customers a lot. We are not out there banging the drum for new sales right now. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think we would just burn through a lot of cash and we don't see that our model, you know, is uh, particularly effective and any more or less effective now, probably actually a little bit less effective um, in terms of what we would spend to acquire customers. So we're spending a lot of time with our current customers. We're prototyping new products. We're actually trying to get ready to bring new products to market. Um, and we're kind of taking the long view. And so we actually have said, hey, let's hunker down a little bit. Let's, mm -hmm. let's slow down our burn and let's see where this starts to go. Um, and let's make sure, I think like other people have said, that we do really understand what the needs of our customers are. Are they going to evolve? Right? Are, or does that influence the, you know, we're, we're working on some really cool shelving. It works great for apartments. It's modular. You mm -hmm. control it yourself. You can flip things up, flip things down. It's totally cool. Um, is that the right product? Should we be coming with some different products? Like, you know, just trying to get a sense of, is it a different world? Is it the same world for us? And, and I don't think we have enough data yet to really know. Mm. Yeah, I can, I can see on the bookshelves, you know, because I, I think every, since everybody's doing conference calls, like, how do you create a bookshelf that frames a purpose and perfectly right in all the background um so yeah exactly you know I, I so like get it. yeah well i mean it's a, it raises an interesting point because we use all sustainably harvested wood we think we have a really cool story mm -hmm. but you know the media one thing i thought was in this time since the media has a you know is looking around for stories to cover could we get more media attention um and would mm -hmm. this be a good time to go you know focus on pr and you know, it's caused some reflection because while we have a great sustainable story, we don't use, you know, quote unquote, intercepted ocean plastic or whatever, like, you know, the, the term of the day is that the, you know, media wants to get all a flutter about. Um, that's like the greatest, you know, environmental, you know, save the planet, you know, product du jour. Um, we have a long-term sustainability strategy, but I'm someone who's used to being able to get a lot of press and we haven't been able to get a lot of press. So it's making me think, well, if we go down this path of doing shelving, should it be from intercepted ocean plastic? 
mm. and put a big recycled, you know, I like thing that. on the front of it. So when like you are, you know, on your Zoom call, mm. you can show your values as you're on your call. So, right. you know, in some respects, it is definitely getting us to think about how do we as a green company enable people not only to shop their values, but maybe actually display their values. Love that. Love that. Well, and Courtney, you work with a lot of startups too, whether you're out enterprising and helping them with their maybe new tech or their new launch. Um, I, I can imagine that the conversations you're having have either slowed down or maybe they've uh, actually picked up because now they need to make pivots. I'm very curious the what, what, what you're experiencing at the moment with uh, the startup ecosystem since you're so so pivotal to that space. Um, yeah, no. So for, you know, my current role, um, you know, at Amplify Labs, mm -hmm. which is, you know, a startup focused software dev shop, I've definitely noticed like a combination of things. There have definitely been conversations that have slowed down or, you know, some of the people that we work with, um, maybe we finished the first phase of their project and, you know, they're going to raise more money, but recognize that given the industry they're in, you know, maybe now is not a good time to raise yet because uh, you know investors are focusing on certain you know maybe more relevant industries right now that you know they don't fall into um so i'm definitely noticing kind of a combination of things um, my own team actually our co-founders um you know have recognized um i know some people have mentioned this earlier um about you know there being networking events but because they're online, they're sort of people are losing the, the in-person networking aspect. So my team's actually been working on um, a new platform to help sort of integrate um, the more like one-on-one -on -one networking within a, a Zoom type of a you know, platform. So uh, they've been working on that. They've been in the Riot, um, their most recent uh, um, accelerator program working on it. So that's been kind of exciting to see even my own team um, making some you know pivots there to respond to this time. Um, and then separately from you know being part of a tech startup, you know, I still um, am very much so involved in um, the food startup world in the Raleigh-Durham area and, right. you know, right. get connected with a lot of food entrepreneurs um, and talk to them plenty. And recently I've been talking to some folks who are running um, various companies, but, you know, recognize the importance of adding a delivery model um, hmm. and, you know, hmm. reached out to me to ask if I could provide any sort of guidance. And, you know, as they adjust to this model, and I'm you know, more than happy to you know, share with them all my secrets now to make this process easier for them. Right. So um, there's been a lot of conversations on that side of things. I can imagine. And for those of you that don't know, Courtney, she had an exit with a company that took food and delivered it to people's homes. And this was food that maybe wasn't uh, your A prime produce, but was certainly, you know, acceptable. And, uh, you know, you had a massive exit there, which was great uh, working with Duke University. Um, and I love that you're where you are in this role of now helping startups through this space. And even this morning, heard a story from NPR how, you know, that farm to CSA model is exploding right now because people want more of that connection with regards to the sourcing of their food. Yeah, absolutely. I um, For the most part, I'm very grateful I'm not running my company right now oh, because from a logistics is... standpoint, exactly. it would be a nightmare oh getting produce into our warehouse. Oh, Who knows yeah. if that stuff's arriving on time? And right. then you know, would my drivers feel comfortable with making deliveries to so many people's homes? Sure. Like So on that side of things, it'd be really complicated. But right. I mean, demand would be through the roof, I'm sure. And we would be getting you know, so many more customers and increasing our revenue if I were running this company. But yeah. it would be a real headache at the same time. So. Well, Melody, you know, I know you have your own business, of course, but then your your point center on One Million Cups, which is a national organization, um, who are really there to feature startups um, to the community and to be able to provide those startups with help and guidance. And, uh, you know, the struggle I see happening with a forum like that, although Juan's figured out a way to, to work with this virtually, I'm wondering if you're seeing any initiatives with One Million Cups to create maybe some virtual events, because I, I think that ecosystem of One Million Cups has been such a powerful catalyst in communities you know, nationwide to help startups with the conversation that they need to have about their business, not only with the community, but also, of course, with potential investors. Um, yes. Well, one of the, you know, one of the ways I've been leading the Asheville chapter um, of One Million Cups is 
really intuitively and I, I sort of um, sense in what maybe the community is uh, needing um, as individual entrepreneurs. And in this time so far, you know, we've had some incredible um, resources with, and, and One Million Cups is really the connection to the resources that are available right. um, with, of course, ourselves being one. But, you know, entities like Mountain Biz Works and Supportedly, and um, now there's COVID Mobilize. So these are um, ways to get, you know, startup entrepreneurs linked to something that they need. I mean, we've been to this point in a place where everybody's trying to really hone in um, to their personal lives and professional lives mm -hmm. and sort of see what needs the most attention mm -hmm. first mm -hmm. and get, um, get grounded, get grounded based on where we are right now. And I, I didn't feel that tacking on another Zoom call while it would be nice to connect uh, was really the appropriate tone for right now. Um, and also, you know, giving everybody a little space and time to sort of get their bearings and get individual coaching and guidance, knowing, you know, we've done a really incredible job over the years of informing the community that we're, we're here mm -hmm. um, and that we can link them up to something that they may need. So um, we're here for that connection right now. Um, as far as One Million Cups National, um, some communities are starting to do virtual mm. uh, meetups mm. and that's something we're considering. Mm -hmm. um, they are also even hosting their annual organizer summit virtually. Um, and, you know, I'm gonna, we'll send something out because anybody that wants to help be, you know, an organizer as well can just get on, get on that team exactly. as too. Uh -huh. um, you know, nor we normally take summer off anyway um, over see. the last couple of years. Right. Um, I don't see us resuming in person till early as September. I hope that we can do that. Um, but, you know, in the meantime, I feel like there is actually so much going on that I don't I don't know that in Asheville it's the right thing uh -huh. yet. Yeah. And but I think providing. But but I do feel that, um, you know, in, in finding out some of the other One Million Cups communities that are doing pitching, I mean, it's it's easy now. You can, you know, now that there's no travel, um, any local entrepreneur can apply to present in any community all over the country. And now, up, you know, if they're doing a virtual, they can now present and pitch all over the country where normally that wouldn't necessarily be as easy to do. That's so I think that's awesome. a really cool thing that's yeah, opened is. up. That's huge. I didn't so know that. So now that broadens, mm -hmm. yep, broadens the space and, um, and we'll figure out what, what we're going to do here next, but we're taking that step by step. Well, I think that's a perfect segue also to uh, Zell Nelson, who is uh, one half of collaborative awareness with Maureen McCarthy and the blueprint of we, because I do believe that the culture that you're trying to nurture in people and organizations is this acknowledgement of not only the connection, oh, do we lose him? Okay, no worries. Um, one of the things that I love about the work that Zell and Maureen have done, which then they were featured on the YouTube channel and of course um, the, uh, the podcast was just how this dialogue has to be in place when you're not only relating to your organization, but also to yourself and creating essentially what they call a blueprint of we, so, so that there's, there's a clear understanding of how to navigate that relationship and to be very clear about it. Um, they do some great work. But what I did just hear is that Christoph from Berlin is here, the pitch doctor. Um, and Christoph, thank you so much for joining yes. us from Berlin. Um, thrilled that you could make it. And, you know, I, I, I know that in Europe, the pitch competition and pitch events are things that are very robust there. 
um, certainly equally to the U.S. in many regards. And you're you're a pretty significant part of that that culture. And I'm wondering what you're experiencing there, and then how you're advising or doctoring these startups to help them mm. uh, connect better with their both their pitches, but also their relationships with their potential investors. Yeah, I mean we're we're in the phase of figuring that out right now. I mean all. The demo days of like accelerators I work for have been moved online. I got two invitations to online demo days just today from from mm -hmm. my clients. So mm -hmm. everything is moving online, and we're trying to figure out how can we make it as valuable as the offline event would have been. Um, I think there is actually upside because the geography doesn't matter anymore. So I think some of these demo days might actually be more valuable for the teams because more people that are not from the city or maybe wouldn't have traveled to like Munich or Hamburg in Germany um, will still listen in because it's just an easy click for like an hour and a half right. and they can check out 10 startups from Germany. So I think there is upside in all of that, but there's also obviously something that we have to figure out, like how do you get the the one-on-one -on -one conversations that you normally would get at a demo day, how do you do that online? And that's where everybody's trying out tools and different approaches. And I think in like two months, we'll, we'll know a lot more. And since I think we'll, we'll have this issue for a long time, I think there's still sort of a little bit of a runway to, okay, in like half a year, we'll have a really perfect online demo day all figured out. Yeah, I can, I can absolutely uh, sense that uh, we are in a flux of change and it's, it makes sense that people are going online uh, to have more of these conversations. And frankly, I think it's a great opportunity for WatchPitch to be in this place to coach people as to how to do that in a very short, condensed amount of time. So we're even looking at how to pivot our platform a little bit to complement this, this current climate. Uh, I'm, I'm so grateful for all of you. We've hit our, our one hour mark and I know we could do three hours of this, but I, I wanted to just thank you to, for celebrating with me the opportunity uh, that we've had to create 50 episodes of the Watch Pitch podcast and YouTube channel and content. I want to thank you all from your respective time zones for reaching out to me and being part of our Watch Pitch uh, celebration and our 50th episode. Uh, thank you so much to both the production team here at uh, MV, uh, at, at, at uh, uh, sorry, AVL Live, uh, Matt Dunn, uh, AV Live, uh, dot co, um, that made this all possible. Um, and I look forward to the next 50th episodes, right? Let's just, I'm going to do that. I'm going to say that. Thank you so much to all of you. <laughs> And uh, just God bless to you and your families. And uh, let's just keep doing this. But I want to end on the note of how important it is to connect with one another. And this pre-roll will uh, highlight that as well as a, a, a sort of a wrap up. And I do want to also acknowledge that tomorrow, Friday, um, there is a virtual pitch event and workshop with Angie Flynn MacGyver and her team at CSP, Ignite CSP. And check that out. I think you'll find... Um, some very helpful tips as we move to more online interaction and pitching. Thanks again, everybody. Appreciate it. See ya. Well, my goodness, that was so helpful and I hope valuable to you as well. We learned so much from the startups right now who are working with investor capital. In addition to the investors themselves who are really approaching this new normal a little more cautiously and a little differently than they, of course, have months prior. I think one of the really big takeaways here, though, in the mix of all things, when you level the playing field, is we got to take care of ourselves. We got to take care of not only our own people within our own organization, but we've also got to be sure that we're in authentic relationship with the people that we're engaging as partners in this collaboration between startups and entrepreneurs and investors. And that is a golden rule that no matter what the conditions are around us, are going to always be true. So I'd like to just encourage you to continue to take good care of yourself and your people. In addition to revisiting some of these Watch Pitch podcasts with some of these amazing experts who have really brought some amazing knowledge and experience into the mix as we forge and navigate 
these next several months and perhaps the next several years in the future. Thank you for joining the Watch Pitch podcast and the Watch Pitch video cast. And click on the website, take advantage of the resources that are there for you. And we'd sure like to see you pitching and using this platform in the near future. Thanks again. I'm Trey Scott, founder of Watch Pitch.